LA this week. Breaking news, giant monsters have invaded Little Tokyo. I'm Gil Reyes at the Japanese American National Museum covering this new exhibit, Kaiju vs. Heroes. I'll show you that next. I'm Anna Marcos. We'll show you how Homeless Connect Day connects homeless residents to all the services they need. That's coming up. It's where technology meets fun. I'm Rasha Goel. Up next, find out about this micro amusement park that's in your neighborhood. I'm Yana Kay. Here's what's happening on LA This Week. Homeless housing has proven to be a hot button issue in Sherman Oaks. Anna Marcos brings us more on a recent noisy open house held by Councilmember David Rue. The first ever homeless outreach meeting in Councilmember David Rue's district in Sherman Oaks drew quite a crowd to Notre Dame High School. And it got loud and angry fast. Nothing solves homelessness like a home. These individuals are our brothers, our sisters, our parents and our children. Rue could hardly get a word in. At issue, plans by various council members, including Rue, to build temporary bridge and permanent housing in their districts and neighborhoods to ease the homeless crisis. I look forward to talking all with all of you. We will be happy. Well, I was a little surprised at the anger tonight. Someone who's just deposited themselves on a street corner isn't really a stakeholder in that neighborhood. We cannot put this kind of shelter housing with no requirements for people to get off drugs, to give up their bad habits in the middle of businesses and homes and schools. I don't mind. They can come in my neighborhood. They're in my neighborhood anyway, sleeping on the streets and whatever else they do on the streets. So I'm for the housing. Rue had tables and information exhibits set up to help residents learn about homeless services and housing and what they would do for the neighborhood, but those largely went unnoticed. This in a neighborhood that voted overwhelmingly for Props H and HHH to provide more housing and services for the homeless. Sherman Oaks overperformed the rest of the city and voted over 75 percent to support these two measures because everybody wants knows that we need to tackle this crisis. But more importantly, this begins now. This is how we do it. What we've promised to do is ultimately to put in place a security uh, plan which enhances an added layer of security to any bridge housing location that is placed anywhere in the city. We don't want this in our area, but at the same time we want the homeless problem solved. It's very confusing, convoluted, and there's a lot of arguing. I think that the idea of civil discourse, sitting down and talking with one another, has been lost. People are living on the streets. The alternative to the streets is a building. So we have to have more housing. We have to have more affordable housing. In the end, no solutions yet. No decisions have been made. The mixed reactions made one thing clear. There will be plenty more contentious meetings and open houses ahead. Councilmember Rue says he plans to have more of these kinds of meetings in the future for community feedback. In Chatsworth, families gathered to remember their loved ones lost in a deadly train accident a decade ago. Gil Reyes reports on why this memorial was so important to the community. The bell rang 25 times to honor all 25 victims killed in the worst train crash in modern California history. It happened 10 years ago this month in Chatsworth. Victims included Ron Grace, a beloved guidance counselor. His son Brian spoke to us. The tragedy that hit us all really uh, took a while to uh, kind of revisit those memories, but I think after 10 years, um, it's been a really uh, amazing day uh, to hear from everybody and to see everyone come together um, in the midst of tragedy. The victims' families gathered near Stony Point Park, not far from the crash site, to remember that day. A Metrolink train collided with a Union Pacific freight train 
Investigators say a Metrolink engineer missed a red signal because he was texting. Chatsworth Councilman Mitchell Englander was there for the rescue effort. So many people came together, first responders, police officers, firefighters, neighbors that left the comfort of their own home and their safety to run towards danger. And I'll tell you, from being one of the ones that were there that night, even if you're a first responder, you don't train for that. Also killed was Beverly Mosley, a registered nurse and administrator at Kaiser Permanente. You know, I lost a mom, and while that hurts, it was also really good to be with other people um, that lost somebody, and also the victims. I met a lady today that was, you know, survived, and that was powerful for me to see where she's come in the 10 years. People also remembered LAPD officer Spree DeShaw. DeShaw's parents flew in from out of town for the ceremony. And they said they couldn't have imagined anything better to come together as a community for a memorial to honor their daughter. Um, to me, to hear that was everything, because that's why we did this. After the crash, Metrolink became the first rail network in the nation to begin using positive train control, a computerized system that tracks train locations to help prevent collisions. Metrolink says its rail system is now the safest in the country. LAPD Chief Michael Moore has been on the job for only a short time, but he's getting a big welcome from many LA communities. We joined in for his latest meeting with the Asian American community, where the chief discussed the power of diversity. LA's 57th Chief of Police was treated to a big dose of Far Eastern hospitality and a few handfuls of lettuce in this lion dance performance. The meet and greet for LAPD Chief Michael Moore was hosted by the Law Enforcement Association of Asian Pacifics, or LEAP, to get him acquainted with the Asian Pacific Islander community in LA. Council member David Rue also helped put out the welcome mat. Our new chief um, isn't no stranger. He's been to all of our communities before, and he's been there to speak with every single community from when he was patrol all the way to captain, then when he was commander. The Asian American community has been very supportive of all the police stations through booster associations or any other type of events. This Filipino dance with bamboo sticks got some people moving. It imitates tickling birds. And while not everyone was graceful as a bird, we thought Council Member Rue's moves were pretty smooth. Chief Moore, flanked by some of his high-ranking Asian American officers, passed on the bamboo sticks. But we did catch him getting down with the lion dance. He also stayed pretty busy shaking hands. We're made up of, of, of people from all throughout the world. And the Asian Pacific Islander community, whether they be from Thailand or China or Korea, uh, wherever their origin, uh, they are friends of Los Angeles and friends of, our, of America. And today is just an opportunity for me to reinforce those bonds and to ensure, uh, to ensure them that we're protecting all of our communities. The chief also stated he's determined to make the LAPD even more diverse than it is. I see the future of LAPD. I think it's bright. And, I, and as chief, I, I am committed to, to building our diversity, deepening it even further, finding opportunities for all of us. The lion dance symbolizes auspicious beginnings and good luck. And by the looks of it, the chief is off to a good start. LEAP is made up of members of all law enforcement fields from the Asian American community. It helps promote professional standards, diversity, leadership, and stronger communities. A monthly event in the Valley is working hard to give a helping hand to those in need. We take you to Homeless Connect Day, where all kinds of services for the homeless come together. A place like this is a welcome change from the everyday struggle of living on the streets. And pets are quite welcome at this Homeless Connect Day, which is taking place at L.A. Valley College. This has become a monthly event hosted in different areas of the valley. Nancy and her dog, Loka, both came to get goodies. I found her in the streets and I've been having her ever since. Yeah, they gave us a lot of treats and the food and stuff for her. Oh, her leash. Pretty cool. They gave me a voucher to take her to the vet. Everybody wants to get back on their feet and everyone wants to feel more integrated in society and so being able to provide the resources that allow that, um, supporting whether it's an ID to get connected with your benefits or things as simple as just a, a hot lunch. From undergarments to legal help to housing, Rebecca Salazar and her Aunt Barbara are really liking the one-stop shop event. 
I'm here trying to get um, housing for me and my kids. Well, I got a lot of help today, thank God. I got my, I went to the help me clear up my, my two tickets. I just had uh, open container infractions. And I'm re now I was staying in the park. Now I'm in um, LA Family Housing waiting to get housed. So I'm off the streets and it's a lot better. Well, I came for in and burgers and had uh, a haircut. Housing is really necessary because um, looking for work, you, you know, you want to have a, a place to come back to, you know. The things you don't even realize homeless people on the streets need. For example, one pair of twin sisters has created a group called Sisters on the Streets, and they cater specifically to women. When I was volunteering at the winter shelter, I saw a woman that was really frustrated and trying to get a pair of pants without blood on them, and she spent all the money that she had on tampons instead of food for that day. And so we realized pads and tampons should not be a luxury and you should not have to choose between a meal and hygiene. We always bring clothes, shoes, feminine hygiene, soap, shampoos, books, nails polish. As for these ladies, well, a handbag is more than just a handbag, and that's what they hand out. We give out handbags to women and living in shelters who are looking for work. So the handbag is related to them going to interview, building confidence, and making them feel good about themselves. We're able to give the women who normally walk around with a plastic bag in the street a sense of pride. That sense of pride seemed evident as this woman walked off, not just with a new leash and vet voucher for her dog, but a handbag for herself as well. Councilmember Paul Krikorian started Homeless Connect Days in 2014. This event at LA Valley College also attracted community college students who are experiencing homelessness. According to Krikorian's office, a recent survey found that nearly one in five community college students in the LA area is homeless. More than a thousand seniors show us they still have plenty of get up and go in their communities and on the dance floor. <laughs> There's a party happening at the L.A. Convention Center. Seniors from South Los Angeles having a good old time at an annual luncheon honoring them. It means a lot, a lot, because a lot of people don't do nothing for the senior citizens. South L.A. Councilman Curran Price hosts this party every year, inviting some 1,300 people from his district for a little bit of dancing, a little bit of food, just a small token of his appreciation all their years of service. Seniors play such an important role in our, in our community, and it's an opportunity for us to, to say thank you. Stopping by was the councilman's 92 years young mother, Charlena, LA City Council President Herb Wesson, and all these lively older adults, many of whom have not missed a beat since retiring. I spoke to people who still volunteer through church and other community activities. When he's not dancing, Omawala Ola helps feed people experiencing homelessness. Give away food, you know, food banks, these kind of things. Stay active. And if you're looking to volunteer, the LAPD wants you. We do, and especially like at the front desk and helping our officers and doing callbacks to victims to see, you know, um, are they satisfied or if any more information has come out. They can help us with mailers. They can help us with events when we do a community event. There's so much things that they can do. And our young officers, not only do we need the help, but we need their talent. We need their experience. And their energy, too. The annual luncheon is now in its 18th year with no signs of slowing down. Well, nothing teaches you better to become a firefighter than hands-on training. And some young ladies got a first-hand look at what it takes to become one of LAFD's finest during the 5th annual LAFD Girls Camp. Chief Ralph Terrazas of the Los Angeles Fire Department encourages these young women at the LAFD Girls Camp, a two-day camp for girls between the ages of 14 to 18 that introduces them to a career with the fire department. Today, at a minimum, what I expect to happen is that our young women will get confidence, they'll see their future if they choose to pursue that career, and you'll see role models that you'll interact with throughout the day. I'm here for to become a firefighter, and I'm really interested in doing this because this is like a passion that I always have. Six stations were set up to put their skills to the test. 
We have interactive training exercises where we teach them how to handle a hose, teach them how to use power tools, climb ladders, first aid and CPR. So we give them all the tools and techniques they would need. For many, it's exciting just to have the opportunity to explore this option. I'm looking firefighter, police or the military. So this is just another way for me to know if like I do want to pursue just the firefighter or if I want to go to something else. I wish when I was younger they would have had those programs. So I'm like, I get emotional again because she's like wanting to do something at such a young age. The camp is held twice a year during the spring and fall. For many of these young women, they will leave not only having learned about the fire department, but about themselves. It's really the, the, the belief that you can do anything you set yourself to do. It's really this, this inner strength and this belief in yourself that you can do and grow up to be anything you want to do. You just got to believe in yourself and you have to try. You have to show up and you have to be committed to the two-day event. And I think that the strength that you're going to derive from these exercises are going to be something that are going to be very valuable to you in the years to come. And for those who are interested in continuing with the Los Angeles Fire Department, there are a few more workshops they'll have to go through. Officials say one can become a firefighter at 18 years old if they've completed and passed all the training. The camp is a free program. For more info, visit joinlafd.org. A boyhood obsession with Japanese toys becomes a museum exhibit that's much more than child's play. We take a look at how World War II tragedies influence Japanese pop culture in a monstrous way. Look, Godzilla and other strange beings have invaded Little Tokyo, all part of a new toy exhibit at the Japanese American National Museum. When I was young in the 90s, I was exposed to Godzilla, Ultraman, so it was really nice to see this um, exhibit. It's called Kaiju vs. Heroes. Kaiju is Japanese for giant monster. I watched people coming out of the exhibition. Some of them are very nostalgic, but a lot of people start, you know, thinking about their culture. August 1945, the bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki devastated the Japanese people. But from the ashes, a pop culture giant emerged, Godzilla. The movie Monster was a metaphor for mass destruction in the atomic age. The popularity of Godzilla and other kaiju films helped Japan rebuild its economy after World War II. With television came toys of these supersized characters. Enter Japanese-American collector and illustrator Mark Nagata. In the exhibit, Nagata shares some of his favorite action figures from childhood and also shares some of his own creations as founder of Max Toy Company in San Francisco. That is just a tiny fraction of his collection. Now, one of the highlights of this exhibit is this interactive game where, as one of Mark Nagata's creations, the Aizen, you can destroy parts of Little Tokyo. It's actually really fun. Yep, that's me, a giant monster. That's City Hall to the right, LA This Week Studios on the left, or was our studios. It's all in good fun, of course. The exhibit, it'll remain standing at Little Tokyo's Japanese American National Museum through mid-March. Curators say through pop culture, people can learn about the struggles of the Japanese and Japanese Americans while still having fun. The museum is open Tuesday through Sunday. Well, the circus is in town right here in our arts district. But this circus is a little different than your normal one. Rasha Goel takes us to LA's 2-Bit Circus. Hey everyone, I'm at the 2-Bit Circus Micro Amusement Park. And let me tell you, this is a place where fun meets technology. And it's right here in downtown Los Angeles. Now, it's got some of your old favorite video games, but you get the carnival feel all in a technological sense. And for VR lovers, well, there's something here for you as well. Come on, let's go take a tour. thousand square feet of fun. Two-Bit Circus is the brainchild of co-founders Brent Bushnell and Eric Gladman, both who come from a tech background, and Gladman who has also been a former circus performer. 
They say it's something that was needed in the downtown community and helps bring people together and socialize. I toured around for many years. I was an acrobat, an aerialist, and a fire dancer, and a clown. And here, I get to do both of those things. I get to be a performer, and I get to build high-tech crazy fun. Seriously? We've really focused on things that are social. Four players standing games, four players seated games, really getting stuff that's both fun to play as well as fun to watch. And there's plenty to explore. A carnival midway, a 100-seat game show theater, games, restaurant, and bar. And here's something you won't see every day. We have a robot bartender. His name is Guillermo Del Poro. He was completely custom built for the single sole purpose of getting people drunk. And he makes a mean motor oil martini. Mayor Eric Garcetti and Bill Nye, the science guy, also came out to check out the fun. This will be the new arcade, a place where you don't just sit at a machine by yourself, but you interact and do things together, where we can take the future and not be scared of it, but we can actually tame it and steer it to the things that we want to be, the things that we want to do. What is this here, if not the useful arts <laughs> of entertaining ourselves? So people have taken STEM and they've made it into STEAM, science, technology, engineering, <laughs> art, and math. Wow. And for me, one of the coolest things was soaring and flying above the city through this virtual reality simulator. So being on this makes you feel you're a bird, basically. Woo! Oh, I just crashed. We love technology, and so we've applied a lot of the, you know, the latest tech that we can find from different kinds of cameras and virtual reality to cheap sensors and, and have built our sort of modern take on the circus. Two-Bit Circus is a permanent fixture in downtown Los Angeles, but the neat thing is they have the ability to change up the games. We've built this as the movie theater for interactive, so we're constantly able to change the content, keep it fresh, uh, you know, both with the stuff that we're making as well as things that partners are making. So we've made this as a showcase for different kinds of game makers, from touchscreen games to console games, even board games and card games. So step right up and try your hand at some of these exciting games. A modern circus right here in our backyard. 2-Bit Circus is free to enter and you simply pay for attractions, games, food and drinks using a playing card. A memorial sign is dedicated to a fallen LA DOT officer. Traffic on the west side gets back to normal after a project is finished early and a new Baldwin Hills playground gets kids moving. All these stories in City Beat. Councilwoman Nuri Martinez, Councilmember David Rue, and the LA Department of Transportation pay tribute to fallen LA DOT officer Gregory Park and his family with a memorial sign dedication at the northwest intersection of Victory Boulevard and Columbus Avenue. Park was hit by a car involved in a traffic accident nearby. Park is remembered as a military veteran who served his country and then returned home to serve his community for 12 years. His death is a reminder that LA DOT traffic officers faithfully serve Angelinos while putting their own lives on the line every day. I think it's evidenced by how many people have come here today that Gregory Park was not just a great traffic officer, but he was also a great person. The Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has completed a major water infrastructure project located in Benedict Canyon well ahead of schedule. The project had been scheduled to finish on November 30th, but was completed two months earlier because of a well-coordinated effort involving LADWP water system staff working in partnership with the Office of Councilmember Paul Koretz. Cost savings is estimated at $1.8 million. The Benedict Canyon water pipeline replacement began on May 1st. The project replaced 5,200 feet of pipes that had been originally installed in the 1960s with new steel pipes along Benedict Canyon Drive, south of Mulholland Drive to Hutton Drive. The city's Department of Rec and Parks, along with Council President Herb Wesson, celebrated the grand opening of Jim Gillian Recreation Center's playground. This new playground features two vibrant play structures for children ages 2 to 5 and 5 to 12. Both play structures include shade canopies to shield kids from the sun and encourage families to spend more time at the park. The playground includes a variety of play panels, musical equipment, slides and climbers for the younger players. There's also an area of pods, nets, hoops and balance beams where children can test their balance and a merry-go-round 
developed to build their upper body and grip strength. LA's art scene is known for creating trends, and we found a new breed of art, Documenta, which brings a four-legged point of view to the mix. This art show caters to artistic tastes of the canine kind. The Documenta Art Gallery at 7th and Fig first made its grand debut in New York last year, and now it's wowing doggy art connoisseurs in L.A. <laughs> the show's creators believe there is something humans can learn about how dogs approach art. There is an opportunity here to go with a dog's attitude of curiosity and excitement and open-heartedness. And yes, marking your territory is allowed in this art viewing. One couple brought their dog Chewy to the grand opening. We try to do any and everything that's available for dogs, uh, whether they're parades for dogs or costume contests or... You know, just meets and greets. Everything about this exhibit caters to dog sensibilities with things that smell, squeak, and are otherwise attractive to canines. Even the shape of this dog is what is most friendly and popular with dogs. There's even a bacon tongue. Chewy seemed pretty indifferent to this masterpiece, until he heard the squeak, that is. But some of the other artistic work drew rave reviews from Chewy. He definitely liked the couch, yeah. He, he, he wanted to sit there for some time. Some dogs dressed to impress for the occasion. This is our, um, our first doggy event, so I just thought, you know, if she looks nice, then we could take better pictures with her. It's something fun for him to do, and I can take some cute pictures of him. <laughs> the owners seemed happy to take a back seat to their canine art lovers, snapping pictures right and left and doling out treats for proper artsy etiquette. Dogs make life more fun and joyful, and they bring so much and lo love, and they're like your best friend. To learn more about the canine-inspired art show, visit Documenta.org. The shows are made possible by the group Arts Brookfield, which brings arts and cultural events to downtown venues like 7th and Fig. Join Councilmember Paul Krikorian for a community hike, support local artists at the Alvera Street Muertos Art Walk, or enjoy local music during the Eagle Rock Music Fest. All this in this week's Things to Do. Hit the trails with Councilmember Paul Krikorian for a community hike to explore the Verdugo Mountain Park. Councilmember Krikorian will lead a hike with community members along the park's trail this easy-to-moderate hike through Verdugo Mountain Park offers beautiful views of the San Fernando Valley. Remember to dress accordingly for the weather and the outdoors and to bring water and sunscreen. Hikers should meet at the intersection of Edmore Place and Olivia Terrace before the hike begins. This is a great opportunity to explore the community, meet neighbors, and enjoy the great outdoors. The hike takes place Saturday, October 6th from 9 to 10.30 a.m. at Verdugo Mountain Park in Sun Valley. Join in for a day of free family fun and entertainment. In its fifth year, the Alvera Street Muertes Art Walk brings together artists from the greater Los Angeles community. Shop small and shop local by supporting these artists and the merchants on Alvera Street. More than 40 local artists will be selling original artwork, clothing, jewelry, face painting, and more. The event is free and open to the public. The Muertes Art Walk takes place Saturday, October 6 at 10 a.m. on Alvera Street. For more, visit alveraevents.com. It's the 19th annual Eagle Rock Music Festival. This by locals, for locals community street festival celebrates the diverse talents and imaginations of the musicians, artists, community members, and merchants of Northeast Los Angeles. The 19th annual Eagle Rock Music Fest is produced by Center for the Arts Eagle Rock in partnership with Councilmember Jose Huizar and CD14. It takes place October 6th from 4 to 10 p.m. For more, visit eaglerockmusicfestival.org. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kane from all of us here at LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org and check out our newest social media videos, LA This Minute. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.